The presenting sponsor for On Education is Classcraft. We're excited to announce Classcraft's new story mode, which makes it easy for educators to harness the power of stories. Episodes 1 and 2 of Season 1 are ready for you and your students to play today, and it's completely free. To learn more about Classcraft and the new story mode, simply visit classcraft.com slash oneducation. I was throwing things around the house. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Welcome to On Education, part of the On Podcast Media Network. I'm Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Irvin. Friends, we have an awesome plot for you today. We will discuss the Ontario teachers' strike, debate whether you could be an effective teacher without ever taking work home, and our guest this week is educator and consultant Desiree Alexander. So I was just thinking about it just just as we were getting started, and, and we just got off talking with uh, our good friend Steve uh, Isaacs and and I and I had mentioned Civilization Six. I don't know if you've ever done this before, um, and and I'll, I'll see if any of our listeners have. But I saw a video on YouTube today that had like a bit of an exploit for Civilization Six, hmm. and I totally went and tried to like replicate. I was like dying to see if it worked, so I spent the better part of like an hour and a half this afternoon just trying to get this thing to work in civilization six have you ever like yeah a bit of a cheat let's be honest it's a bit of a cheat i used to do that in skyrim all the time there's a different things that you can do to be able to quickly accelerate someone's strengths you know whatever it might be but there's all kinds of stuff so then you become like this powerhouse that just runs around skyrim hacking and slashing just, and killing the dragons saves, it just saves you tons of time uh sure. to be able to kind of get going as far as on the uh skyrim adventures uh it is like dragon schmagen <laughs> you know uh I but people have figured out some different techniques like you just said exploits to be able to go ahead and uh whatever you know boost up your guy or do something crazy that you normally uh, couldn't do it's also fun that's what i like about games Mm-hmm. It was just fun. Sure. I I got to like like level up Russia in like fifteen turns, where normally it would take like three hundred, and then I just went <laughs> and like stomped everyone um, because you know that's what you would do. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, we we have a couple updates. Um, you know nothing nothing that we haven't talked about before, but uh, we want to just make sure everyone heads to YouTube and subscribes to the On Education channel. There, the the bests are rolling along. Um, we've enjoyed doing them, and and we think it's really cool content. And I think it's helpful. So so pop onto On Education's YouTube channel and and smash that subscribe button, friends. Uh, you won't regret it. And if you if you like the video, then head over to the Patreon site and and consider giving us uh three or four well no it's not three or four it's four four dollars a month um and if you you become one of our patrons you get access to the full video uh of the podcast which uh you know we're trying to do and do well and we'd like to run less ads so this is how we thought we could do it so i got a little heat on the home front this week because um, cause we spend a lot of time talking about the United States and U.S. Um, teacher issues and teacher mm-hmm. walkouts and stuff like that. But, buddy, it's not going well up here. Mm. It's bad right but now. Usually we're bragging about you guys' systems, Ooh. everything, health care, education. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that this is associated with... Uh, this last election that you guys had, yeah, the well, right. the provincial election, yeah, Mister yep. Mister Ford, yeah. I'll, I'll be honest, it's worse than like I thought it was going to be bad, and it's okay. worse. I think wow. it's worse than everyone thought. Okay, um, it's 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 bad on multiple levels. Uh, and, and so the long and the short of it is, and we'll put some notes in the, in the show notes, some articles to read. Um, but the Ontario teachers across the board, uh, K to 12 are, are in strike positions. 
Um, so our, our walking out and here's, um, it's, it's super complicated. Uh, in, in Ontario, the government has a history of legislating teachers back to work, um, okay. as, as what they would call an essential service. So, so as an essential service, you're not allowed to strike. Okay. <laughs> so they basically pass a law that you can't strike. So, yeah. So historically, every <laughs> time crazy. the teachers, every time the teachers have struck, in the last 10 years or so, the government, and it's been, to be fair, it's been um, liberal governments. I'm not going to call them left-wing governments because the liberals are definitely a centrist party. Uh, And progressive conservative governments, which are basically the the right-wing parties, um, have, they have both legislated teachers back to work as an, called them an essential service and legislated them back to work. So it, it really... Um, cuts them off at the knees as far as having a, any sort of negotiating leverage, power, whatever. Um, so this year, this this in this current job action, what the teachers unions have done is super smart. They haven't struck, they haven't went out for like extended periods of time. They've just went out one day or two days a week. And the other times they've, they've they do what's called work to rule. Where work mm-hmm. to rule is where they just work their, the their hours that are governed by the contract. The job description to a, to the T. Mm-hmm. Um, Good talk so, about work to rule a little bit later too. All right, <laughs> a little <laughs> bit, yeah. I guess. Eh? Yeah. Um, so so it's 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 been going on for a little while now. Um, the the real desires the the the, the the main points of the the teachers walking out have a lot to do with like school safety, class size, teacher support, full day kindergarten is a huge issue. It's been very successful in in Ontario, uh, full day kindergarten. Um, even the actual, uh, we've kind of briefly mentioned this on the podcast. Actually, the the rumor that the the conservative government wants to eliminate kindergarten teachers entirely from mm. teaching kindergarten, just go to early childhood educators uh, instead of actual um, uh, Ontario College of Teachers certified educators. Just to um, pay them less? Right? Uh, certainly, that's part of it. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely part of it. They just basically say a kindergarten teacher isn't necessary, uh, which is obviously ridiculous. Um, and there's been a lot of like, strange shenanigans going on the the most notorious of which is that the minister of education um you know who's you know buddy buddy with some lobbyists and whatever of course um kind of got one of his lawyer pals to run anonymous ads in the newspaper anti-teacher ads in one of the Mm. big toronto newspapers and and as like uh like and so obviously people do digging and figure out who it is and who it was tied to because you know this guy this education minister is a giant idiot so he couldn't cover his tracks very well um so it all got back around to Mm. basically the education minister his buddy starting a little anonymous group to run ads in a major Toronto newspaper like the ads aren't cheap so obviously oh. we knew it was people with money right yeah stuff like that is to what just end? ridiculous just to, to break the teachers just to get them- I mean mostly so one of the things that's different in my mind this time than in a lot of other times and this is actually something I've I have talked about as it relates to this to what's gone in in the states is that the the narrative is completely different this time where where the general support is with the teachers as opposed to with the government. The whole, you know, teachers get the summers off and they have a really easy job and it's like babysitting and blah, blah, blah. And they get paid so much money. Uh, at least that's the narrative in Canada, in Ontario. Mm-hmm. You know, so why should they, they can't, they, they shouldn't be going on strike. You're not hearing a lot of that except for like from the hardcore right people, you're not hearing a lot of that this time. So they're definitely losing the narrative war, um, the, the, the conservative government. And so you get these ads um, that are really pretty hurtful, to be honest, and, and crazy uh, a little bit. And um, 
you know, there are real safety issues. Like, like the one of the things that's not even being talked about a lot is the safety issues related to class sizes. So, so there's lots of like hashtags and class size matters is one of them. And if you go on hashtag class size matters, you'll see a lot of tweets about how the government is trying to increase class sizes. And we know that large class sizes are bad for teaching and learning. Um, but one of the things that is starting to emerge in the narrative down up here in particular is that class sizes are also a safety issue. There aren't a lot of classes where where 30 kids would be like an acceptable room for that amount of people to mm. be working and, and, you know, essentially living in for six to eight hours a day. It's just, it's not safe. Have you seen, and Mike, it's not that, uh, that video by Nick Ferroni? Yeah. I don't know if you follow him. I've seen that, yeah. Where it's 30 seconds of showing you, like, just, I think, for the public to basically just be able to see in 30 seconds what's the difference between having 25 students and then going north of that to 30, 35, 40 yeah. in a regular size classroom. As you just said, it, it does turn into a, a safety situation. You know, when I say it's bad, um, nurses, like all public sectors are getting destroyed by this conservative government pretty badly. Nurses have been actually without a pay increase in Ontario for 10 years. Mm. Which is nuts. So that goes back to previous governments too. But one of the things that struck me, and it, it, it struck other people too, and it's come up in, in conversations, is that a lot of these professions that are getting um, hammered by the conservative government, they're female-dominated professions. Nursing, healthcare, uh, especially like social work and stuff like that. Uh, and then, and then education, education, which is definitely a, a female dominated profession. And, and I, I don't know what that is saying from an ideological perspective. Uh, obviously we know that conservatives have a track record of, you know, wanting to tell females what to do pretty much with everything all the time. Um, you know, especially related to their personal health, but you know, this is, this is it's it's bad up here and and I don't know you know there's no election coming up like not anytime soon so there's not a whole lot of political pressure to you know for them to negotiate anytime soon so when's and, the is it this week the strike so so they've been so they've been walking out so Cheryl is Cheryl's part of this for sure um so they've walked out um I believe 2 days two weeks ago and two days last week and they're scheduled to walk out two days this week and here's the thing here's one of the craziest things if nothing else has been crazy so far the teachers are asking for a two percent increase in in salaries basically commensurate with inflation the cost of living basically a cost of living increase okay and the government is set at one percent. They're they're and they're not moving. Like that's a big sticking point. And they're saying that teachers are asking for too much money. When you strike, when you go on strike in Ontario, and I don't know what it's like, but you forego your pay. Mm -hmm. Like you don't get paid when you're picketing. The teachers okay, have geez. already the teachers have already lost more money in salary than the increase that they're asking for from the days that they've been it would take them three years to make up the amount of salary that they've already lost uh, relative to what they're asking for is the difference. It's not about money. The The narrative that the government is trying to put through is this idea that it's that they're, they're asking for money. It's money. It's mm -hmm. money. It's money, which is another way that um, typical, you know, you know, negotiation happens is that they, they frame it as a money thing only. Um, if it was about money, you know, they wouldn't be striking, they would have negotiated yeah. already. It's not about, it's obviously not about money because they've already lost all the money that they'll win back. And it's very the little negotiation cycles. So, um, you know, they try to get to the table, but the education minister isn't, isn't even negotiating right now. So hmm. it's, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll keep you updated, but it's, uh, it's not looking too good up here. Wow. And, um, it's frustrating for people like us. I, I, I'll tell you, I can't imagine what it would be like for a husband and wife, a family, where they're both teachers. Mm -hmm. That's what we are. That's, it would be. Yeah. It would be like you could people. People will 
could and possibly will, if this goes on any longer, lose their homes. And you're telling me it's about money? Like, kiss my ass. Seriously. It's so <laughs> it's so infuriating. I'm so mad about it that, I mean, people will lose their homes. And they have kids and families and lives. And they're, they're standing up for what they believe in. But they're going to lose everything because they're not getting paid. It's not about money. It's uh, it's insane. Hmm. So that's what's going on up here, man. It's rough. I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, but it's important that people know. I mean, most of our audience is American, but it's. I think it's worthwhile for, for people everywhere to understand what it's like uh, anywhere else, too. So. so it's a lot of the same type of issues, too. Oh. I mean, the same types of situations. So hopefully it gets resolved. I mean, they reach some sort of understanding where... They address some of those big topics. Uh, yeah. So gross, gross. Speaking of gross, yes. <laughs> t- t- Twitter, Twitter has Glenn Irvin hot under the collar, um, <laughs> and and I'm gonna just uh, I'm gonna just let let Glenn talk about it a little bit here. I I just don't think I've been this angry <laughs> in a really long time about something, and I should actually. I should not do. I should take my own advice. Um, I put these top ten edu Twitter tips of how to get started with uh, Twitter and education. And I think number ten is don't take things too seriously. <laughs> That's what it says <laughs> because <laughs> there's going to be things that are going to just rile you up, and this get is one of going. those things. Yeah, and it's it's it was, <laughs> and I, I think we've had it the topic of Alice Keeler on this podcast many times. Okay. Some of them actually we've supported, obviously, sure. what the premise of a specific tweet was, and some of them not so much. Um, and in this case, it's the not so much. Um, and it really, it's infuriating because I have a specific take on this, and I know that other people are not going to totally agree with me, but that's Okay. Because this, that's our platform here. We're going to basically state our opinion and, and why this is uh, ticking me off so much. Um, so basically, I'll read you the tweet. It says, this is Alice Keeler. My husband taught high school English. I think that's important too. High school English. And never, not once, brought any work home. No lesson planning. No grading. Home is home time. And reading through the thread of tweets, he taught for many, many years, according to Alice. As far Up until as, very uh, recently. Yeah, and I'm talking about like as much as I've taught, uh, so in the 20-year range, you know, something like that. I mean, it seemed like it was a, a an extended period of time. Why did it get Glenn so fired up? So many reasons. Okay. But let me start with number one. You just finished talking about something super important, Mike, which is we have this these teacher strikes and the perception is that teachers teach during this – basically your work to rule hours, which are my contract at my school is 7.30 to 3.30. Different schools have different uh, contract hours and we work I, – I don't know how many days I actually have. It's probably 185 or something in there. Uh, it's somewhere in there, average is, is probably about right. Uh, but anyway, I work 7.30 to 3.30 is my contracted hours, and then I have 185 days that I work. And I do have basically what amounts to about close to three months of vacation time. I mean, right. if you include the summer and the different breaks that I have throughout the year – and that I've had at different schools in different states and whatever it might be, very similar. Um, I do have about three months of, of off time. Alice was on our podcast fighting for teacher, uh, basically saying, hey, we're not getting paid enough in all of these different states. It's the same yeah. advocacy that we have had, the same advocacy that you are proposing right now because you're stating teaching might be contracted 730 to 330. But that doesn't mean that that's the hours that you really work. And that is because of so many things that happened that are part of the teaching profession about being a professional. Remember that? We wore the shirts. Teachers are professionals. Well, in my opinion, 
to be a professional teacher and anybody that I'm that uh, I'm mentoring, for example, or anybody that I teach right now at the university level, if I'm speaking to them and I say, hey, by the way, home is home time, make sure, I mean, make that distinction right now and don't bring any work home, don't lesson plan at your house, do everything at the school during those contracted hours and become super efficient to those things. If that's the case, Mike, there is a case for the for the other side of this argument, for yeah. the right wing, for let's whoever whoever these people are, basically the people that don't want us to basically get salaries. We already have it so good, and whatever it might be. If we are only working seven thirty to three thirty, and I earn what I earn, which is a significant amount of money for, let's say a ten month job, and you uh, allocate those monies for a twelve month job, holy God. I make a crap load of money, but we all know that's not the truth, that we work these extended hours during the weekdays and we work on weekends. And we obviously do stuff during the summer too. And mm-hmm. most of that stuff is unpaid. The premise that it's setting and Alice gets followed by hundreds of thousands of people and other people just look in. They're not even following her, but they just are, are looking in. So she has great influence as far as an educational sphere, especially an edge of Twitter. Let's just call it edge of Twitter sphere. She speaks in many schools, in many districts. The premise that that sets, though, that that's saying, hey, this is what you should be achieving, I think is just wrong. I, I think it's wrong, and it's actually making the case against us as far as talking about how much we do work basically outside of the school day, outside of the school hours. So that was the first thing that was firing me up. The second thing is she starts posting underneath this thing, underneath this thread and continuously the uh, last uh, couple of days where she's taking pictures of her husband is like, who's the topic of this conversation, has the chapters of this book that he's going to write yes. about how do you go about doing this. Mm-hmm. It just reminds me of what you just talked about uh, earlier, Mike. It's an exploit to our job. How do we find the keys? Now, should we be as efficient as possible? Yes. Should we find ways to not grade everything? We talk about that too. Not grade mm-hmm. everything. Uh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Should we hyper focus on grading is really not good either. Uh, the part that ticks me off though is this guy's a high school English teacher or was, and there's an important segment of being in a high school English teacher specifically, and my wife is one, where you have to give students appropriate personalized feedback on their writing to become yeah. better writers. You're a writer, Mike. And in mm. order for you to develop that skill, it's like any other skill, you need timely, appropriate feedback that's personalized for you. Not some canned freaking comment from something or something that, you know, it fits in. You need something. And And it gives you that inspiration as a writer to go, cool, I understand what I'm doing and kind of where I'm at as far as the uh, where I'm excelling and what I need to go and work on. Plus, it makes that connection. Your teacher, your educator is working with you to bring you up. It's like coaching. It's like coaching a sport. I'm coaching you up until you become this proficient, in this case, a writer or whatever it actually might be. So I can see that in that lens of an English teacher where I'm like – there's no freaking way you can do your that that in that amount of time. She said no lesson planning. Oh, I just was I I, I was throwing things around the house. I was like, <laughs> what? No lesson planning, no grading, no doing anything. And I I I just think it sets an unrealistic precedent. People that may say, hey, Alice Keeler said that this is what I should be achieving may find themselves in a really bad situation as far as how they are looked upon and how their administrator actually sees them as far as the work that they're actually doing as far as at school. Can someone do this? Yes. I do know that they can. Will they be an effective teacher as I pose as far as in the question? In my opinion, not even freaking close. I mean, you can't do it. You can't. And that's the reason why teachers always talk about it. Ask any teacher out there, what's the biggest problem, you know, as far as an education right now for educators? What, what is the biggest problem? They say time. I just need more time to be able to yeah. do 
do, do, do all of these things, whatever it is that they're doing, be more creative, come up with things, get better feedback, all of these types of things. And then they pull that time and have to extend it out into those hours, those after school hours, those weekend hours and so on and so forth. Um, it just freaking pissed me off. Uh, Go ahead and <laughs> fill it in here because there's a second part to this too that, that was another tweet that came out after this. So what's your commentary so far? Because there's a part about research studies that were then referenced. And that part, I started throwing other things then after oh, I saw that, that I tweet. missed that part. Okay, so – I don't know if you uh, you are familiar with like Hattie's research, right? He did this okay. meta analysis of basically all kinds of different things, um, all kinds of different effective teaching techniques, and he had, he did this basically a a a ranking, let's call it, of what are the most effective things to oh, in, in education. You know, I think I did and see this. And Hattie's Hattie's research in the meta analysis is really controversial, anyway. You know, as far as I, he pulled in thousands of studies and then he basically listed out and so Listed on and so things forth. in a priority and sure. like decolonization is like way at the bottom. Like things to do with equity and racism and stuff are like way down, and it's like whoa, red <laughs> yeah. flag. So there's some things and. Uh, just like many other things, I don't think danger, it was ever, danger. Yeah, it was never meant to do that specifically. You know, it was never meant to rank things like when we right. talked about Sammer or whatever it might be. It was never meant to say this is good, this is bad. It was a meta analysis of a bunch of studies, and basically they talk about like what are the most effective things on, on you know on uh, uh, as far as teaching methods. And anyway, she said, take a look at Hattie's research. If it's below this scale, below 0.5, let's yeah. say 0.4, trash it, right? So, of course, people <laughs> go like off the deep end because there's so many things on 0.4 and below yeah. that we know are super important. And one of them was funny because it had to do with basically what she does a lot of her career. Besides being an educator, she is a uh, a digital tools expert. Let's call sure. it that. Okay. Um, and one of the things on Hattie's research that's on the low end is <laughs> talks about digital tools and instructional oh, methods boy. that have to do with online teaching methods and all these types of things that are a thing. So it was just so many things so wrong with that and using it in those ways. And I understand people are going to come back and go, Glenn, you shouldn't get so worked up about this. You know, people should be able to if they're not going to um, if they're not going to take. If they're going to decide, they're not going to do work at home, they should be able to, allowed to do that. You know what? Yes, you should be allowed to do that. But I should be allowed to call you out and say, I don't think you're doing an optimal job. I just don't. I don't think you could ever be so efficient in the little bit of time that we have as far as at school that you can be a great teacher in that amount of time. And many people have – I don't know what kind of prep period you had, Mike – Mm. Or if you had one, mm -hmm. but many people have a prep period that's uh, 50 minutes or less. And so a lot of uh, schools in the United States are kind of these seven period schedules and they're about 45 to 50 minute classes. You have 50 minutes of preparation time each day, very little time to be able to go ahead and basically get all of you, like number one, prepare for the classes, classes that are coming. It's not a lot of time. Lesson plan, mm. give feedback to your students. Grading. Then teach six classes mm -hmm. you know, during that, that day. Or in your case, you taught like 15 classes because you have all these little kids coming in every 25, 30 minutes. You know? Yeah, you have these things. And then you're going to do all of that amazing lesson planning and you're going to do it all in that amount of time that's allotted to you. Not going to happen. Not, not at the level yeah. that I want it to go in and happen at, which is yeah. – what we all should be aspiring towards, which is – I'm throwing my mic around here. Sorry. Um, which, what we should be aspiring towards, which is being the best educators that we can be. And our kids yeah. can see that too. They can see our work is there and they can see that kind of like uh, – for example, I'll give you a quick example. All of the work that I put in doing Minecraft stuff, mm -hmm. I had so many kids just offhand years later just come and say – Things like, hey, what you were doing there, 
we know it took a lot of time, but you know what? We really appreciate because we remember some of those moments as far as what was happening as far as in class. And there's a lot of things I don't remember about high school and, and yeah. about things, but there's things that I remember specifically about your class. And I would not have been able to do any of those things if I didn't put in my time after school hours and on weekends and during the summer and making sure that I, I really work on my craft to be the best educator that I could be. So that's my giant raff, uh, rant. And I know that people, you, it, I know you're, I just read some comments, even including our guest for next week, which is Steve Isaacs. I read some comments of his and he doesn't have the same take as me. And I totally respect all of you guys as far as thing goes, but I had to go off here. <laughs> I, so <laughs> you're the voice of reason here. I, I don't know if I'm the... Listen, listen, Alice, the tweet was dumb. <laughs> I mean, only in the sense that it the of the way it was perceived. That was like, that's the problem. The real problem here. Mm. Uh, I can, I can, and I think Glenn would be fine if I didn't unequivocally agree with the premise mm. that if you aren't bringing home your work, you're a, not a good teacher i don't totally agree with that though i understand the, the so the nature of the work is also a mm -hmm. distinction here um i did not do grading from home i i brought no grading work home with me i did teach 400 kids and i did teach 15 classes at one point 15 computer science classes so I am a good model for this in terms of like finding the balance between home life and, and your work life. Cause I had taught a giant amount of children at one point I did though, do a lot of research. I did a lot of planning. I did mm -hmm. a ton of thinking, just like writing notes and creating bookmarks in my, you know, that I could bring back to school and like figure out what to do. And especially early on when I didn't have a clue what to do and there were like, think about what computer science teaching was like, like eight or 10 years ago when there wasn't a exactly. whole lot of resources. I was the dude like compiling resources because yeah. there wasn't a lot out there. I was the one making resources in some cases, like that QR code board that we were talking about with Tanya Avarith. That was like, I did that eight and a half years ago and people are still yeah. trying to figure out how to do that stuff. So that's the world that I lived in. But with that being said, I did not bring a lot of, I did, brought very little grading home. Um, now, also, one of the things that, uh, and this isn't an ad because they're not a sponsor, but Schoology changed my life mm -hmm. in terms of being able to assess kids' work. Uh, I was able to do it so much faster. Yes. Once I once I had uh, an LMS and in a proper LMS with a proper grade book and a proper rubric system inside the LMS, it changed everything for me. It made my life so much easier, which is why, um, even though. Um, you know, I'll still, t we, I still talk up Schoology all the time, even though I'm no longer like a Schoology ambassador. Or, I'm an ambassador in, at heart, I guess. Still. <laughs> you still um, are. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, the only other thing, and I kind of got fried for this a little bit, this, but this is the part that Steve Isaacs and I kind of agree on, mm -hmm. is that Barton Keeler's a good dude. He's a nice guy. And... <laughs> and and I'll tell you, I mean, his wife travels the world a lot, and they have five kids. And I actually once, face-to-face, -face, asked Alice how they do it. And she, with the biggest smile on her face, like like a loving smile, not like a gotcha smile, but like a nice, like it was a nice little moment for her. And I, she said, I have an awesome husband. That's what she said. And she meant it flat out. She said, I she don't said, doubt that. Yeah. She said, she said it. She said, I have an awesome husband. Quote, I have an awesome husband. And I believe it because, um, you know, he was teaching when she was doing a lot of like, like, I, I don't think she travels and does as much as she used to. But when she was in those prime years where she was doing that, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2014 to 2017, let's say, she was probably gone three weeks a month. And Lots, Barton yeah. Keeler was holding the house down and working as a teacher. 
he didn't he was a teacher right up until probably about a year and a half ago as far as i know um so i just i i i felt bad for barton a little bit as I far mean, as him being thrown out there in this conversation yeah yeah because yeah, of well, a dumb because of a dumb tweet and but the follow-ups mike some of the follow-ups are, are, pretty bad are too. even bad too i'm just talking yeah. about taking pictures over your husband's shoulder of the book he's about to write yeah. to show Buy the book us, he'll tell you how because yeah. because because we are too dumb to actually understand it. Oh, yeah. you don't have to actually bring any work but, home, you dumbs. But, Let yeah, me show but my you man how. Gets it, but my man gets it. I got chapters one through twelve. Once you read this book, you're gonna be like, yeah. "Gosh, I can't believe I was so inefficient with my time." <laughs> now, I this book right here. I just paid fifteen dollars for this. This saves me so much damn time. Yeah. I don't even need to worry about to actually work it on the weekends or being able to do those types of things. I'm actually doing it all during the school day. Super unrealistic and crazy uh, bad expectations to set for this profession, which. We work our butts off and it's part yeah. of what we end up doing. And the reason why we have to do it is this is kind of timely manner of things, timely personalized feedback. That's what I would call it as far as the thing goes. And he, her stating that he was an English teacher really was the biggest trigger for me and I, because I, I lived this life with the my wife doing this and she uses Schoology. She's super efficient. Yeah. She doesn't waste time. She and works her butt two, off. Two kids. She works her butt off. She does all of the things that we all do, you know, as far as teaching life. But she's working on the weekends and she's working after school. And it's not because she hasn't read this guy's book. It's because this is the commitment that you have to have in order to be able to do the job effectively we've actually calculated out too mike we went she has 120 students of high school students i just told i was like okay let's say you could actually do that how much prep time versus you know the number of students and the feedback that you have to give how much time could you actually give and it was ridiculous basically spending a minute per week on each one student on the feedback that you're going to give to them just isn't enough not not for someone that teaches English and teaches writing English. and composition and your and and yep. and the details that have to come from that and the the levels there's so huge diverse levels from college type of writers to people to students that are still basically bringing up their level to whatever grade they actually might be at so and everything in between it just doesn't make any sense. Ah. And even the digital, even like, because I know a lot of the, the replies were like, you know, we used, we used, he used digital tools to help him be more efficient and effective. It's like, you, you still have that one minute though. It's one minute to use a digital tool. I mean, first off, let's, let's just talk about the fact that using a digital tool versus face to face is less effective, less meaningful sure. well, but but beyond yeah. that what are you going to type with like you know substance and meaning and 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 gravity in one minute too not much to be honest i mean you might tough. you might type a little more than what you might say um but you're still not you know having a meaningful impact there in mm. one minute so um so much to the, that too dude the, it, it, so it, much it, it lit Twitter on fire yesterday <laughs> and on Saturday. I guess it was on Saturday. And, um, Whew. oh, boy, I got, yep. you know, and I defended Barton a little bit to someone and got lit up even just for, <laughs> like, everyone was emotional about it in, yeah. in a lot of different it's, ways. It hit, hit home really bad for me. So I, that's yeah. that's the reason why I get emotional for that. Yes. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> I, it was a, it was a, it wasn't the smartest tweet in the world for optics. That's for sure. Even yep. if, even if, um, you know, and I think that the methods and the, the substance of the actual tweet, the content is debatable. Um, it's, it's certainly plausible though. You know, I do understand what you're saying about it not being probable, um, I like using those words. I think those, that's a pretty <laughs> accurate way of saying it. It is yep. certainly plausible, um, though not probable and probably not effective. Um, but it's certainly plausible. Um, but it was more the perception that, you know, 
that this person is better than us because <laughs> he does it this way. And then by the book, we'll tell you how um, is is a tough. It's a mm. tough. It's a tough couple tweets there, Alice. Yes. So, yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> you know, but it's what was happening. It's hey. listen. It's, it's a what conversation starter, that's for sure. I don't mind the con- I don't mind the conversation. <laughs> it's a good and, conversation. And I don't mind I think it is yeah, I think a lot of the responses and everything were were really interesting as well. So when we come back, we're gonna talk about the best small conferences in education on the best. So stay with us. On education is brought to you by fidgets. Fidgets are interactive USB sensors that bring your code to life. There's no soldering or wiring required. Simply plug in a fidget sensor, write code in your favorite language, and watch your ideas come alive. Fidgets are used by thousands of STEM professionals globally and are now available for computer science students. Simply go to Bitly Fidgets on Education to get your introductory kit that includes a free sensor worth over $50. That's Bitly Fidgets on Education. Welcome back to On Education and welcome to the bests. Every week, Mike and I take you through a list of our top things, from books to games, from people to ideas. You might have FOMO, missing out on FETC or ISTE or BET in England, but there are dozens of amazing conferences you can go to for great learning experiences without breaking the bank or even traveling far. Here are some of the best small conferences in education. Let's get into it. Mm. So... We've both been to this one, I think. Serious Play is our first conference. I'm going back to Serious Play nice. um, in in Orlando. Last year, they had one in Montreal. Yes. They had both. Yeah. Montreal and Orlando. That's yes. right. That's amazing. So tell us about Serious Play. So Serious Play is, is pretty much exactly the way it sounds, which is actually really cool. Um, you know, what I liked about Serious Play was that it wasn't like your typical, like, and don't get me wrong, take this just exactly the way I say it. <laughs> it wasn't classroom teachers, it was academics talking mm. about research and like journal articles and like like a lot of like, because actually it's funny because we've been talking on the podcast a lot about evidence-based, you know, theories and the, you know, yes. that if you say something, you should back it up with research and like proven fact and serious play is what brings the receipts. So like when you go to serious play, you be prepared to go and listen to academics talk about efficacy studies uh but because it's serious it's it's legit um academics and researchers talking about really academic and research-based stuff so for example in um in orlando this summer steve isaacs and i along with um julie keen who is the director of learning for participate are going to be talking about affinity spaces in gaming um nice. so so like and we even like you like you might name that a different name when if you did that at ISTE or at fetc yeah. you might call it you know starting clubs or or mm-hmm. or you know creating social groups but you know you use different t- verbiage and different language when you go to serious play um, because people are looking for a different type of session, session. there mm. and so it is a it is a serious conference that that has a lot of academics and um and it's it's really quite interesting it was a it was a pretty interesting experience last year in montreal so our next one is another one like the same our, our favorite yeah 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 small conference because we love noah geisel and yep. he runs this it's called the badge summit yep and he has it perfectly placed it happens at the exact same location as isti and it Smart. happens the day before isti actually starts yep. it's a one day event and what i love about it is it gives you that small conference feel because it is a small conference, but with all of the huge names. So if you want to talk to someone that you just aren't going to be able to talk to at ISTE because there's 30,000 people running around, you go to Badge Summit, you sign up for it, you get to go to their sessions, and then you get to talk to them afterwards, maybe even have lunch with them. And it is so freaking awesome. We, we get to listen to these amazing panels the sessions are are small a ten a number of attendees because there's a small number of attendees but with the greatest presenters that you're going to see the next days the upcoming days at ISTE without all of the crowds yeah fantastic yeah. setting and even though it's called the badge summit 
Yeah. I think Noah does a great job on a variety of different topics. So it's not just about badging specifically. Uh, it has to do with a variety of different topics, uh, gamification. Um, yeah, there's anything that you might find that would be discussed at ISTE. You're going to find some types of sessions at, at the Badge Summit. And so really, if you are going to go to ISTE anyway, you might as well see if you can go ahead and go one day early and get to the Badge Summit. You won't regret it. Trust us. And you get a lunch served with it. I'm almost positive that they, they serve a lunch and then they, like you were on a panel during lunch. So you yeah. like a lunch and learn session. You yeah. eat your lunch, you listen to a panel, listen to these great presenters and speakers. Oh, it's fantastic. It's super, uh, it's it's serious because it's a, it's a wicked smart group of people. Yes, it is. Um, present company excluded but it's also pretty pretty casual yes, uh, in the sense that it's it's very chill i mean uh, actually the the funny story of last year right is that i literally rolled in 30 seconds before my session started because mm-hmm. my flight was delayed so i walked into the room set my bags off to the side and walked up on the stage and on i'm like stage. all right i'm here we can start now <laughs> it was uh, it and was you did it. Yeah, you did it nailed it yeah, like nailed bro, it. almost like i knew what i was doing so yeah. Uh, Badge Summit is awesome, and we'll be there. Um, yes. I, I think we'll we'll have the of table course. with the booth, and uh, yes. we'll talk to people. And uh, I'm I'm sure that we'll be presenting something there. Yeah. Um, we haven't really nailed it down with Noah yet. Uh, we'd love to do dig it or ditch it, but Noah will also be pretty busy. You know. Yes, running a conference very busy um so maybe we do dig it or ditch it but with uh someone in noah's place then we get a cardboard cut out of noah to sit beside us and we just put him there <laughs> put him there and, and randomly turn and to noah, and go, noah what, what do you think <laughs> oh good point noah <laughs> well, uh, guys. every once in a while <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, awesome. um, the, the next conference on our list was one we went to last year um and and um it was fairly unanimous uh, at how great this conference is uh U- usm summer spark in milwaukee wisconsin um the home of the home school of mr mike matera yeah it's an awesome school um a lot there's a listen there's a lot of great presenters in that general area of the United States, John Spike, Tisha Richmond, um, Mandy Frelick, um, you know, Mike Matera, um, Scott, what's uh, Scott Beter, Joe Sanfilippo. It's, it's a, it's a great conference. So the next conference that I was thinking about is a conference that happens in the Albany Troy area in New York. So, um, it is called the games in education and they call it a symposium but I call it conference, whatever, you know, type of thing. And it is only 100 to 150-ish attendees. And my goodness, Mike, the people that present at this thing Mm -hmm. for being such a small conference. This is where I met Paul Darvasi, met John Fallon there. He was a presenter there. Uh, Dr. Chris Haskell was a keynote there. Actually, Paul was a keynote there too. And I think John has actually been one of the keynotes there also and the topics that they present are phenomenal so if you're into games as far as games and education and they do everything from you know what i would consider entry level type of things so you can kind of get going as far as using games in your class to really amazing crazy things that you'll listen to part Paul talk about like alternate reality games and so on and so forth and everything in between. Those are the sessions you'll, you'll be able to attend. And it happens usually at the end of August. So mm-hmm. if you are available and you can attend that conference, highly recommend it. This is the one that I was supposed to go to last year yeah. that uh, I couldn't make it to. Um, but um, because Paul and I live so close to each other and so close to Albany, we can yes. drive. Yeah. So I, I think that I'm gonna I'm gonna hopefully Paul's listening and I can like hey Paul I'm gonna swing by and pick you up and, <laughs> and we're gonna Do go it. around go around the lake and and we're in Albany and uh, nice. I would like to I would like to go this year so cause especially because of how bummed out I didn't uh, that I didn't go last year so this is probably the conference that I've experienced the most FOMO over mm. in the history of conferences was, was last year's spring Q. Yes. Um, so Q is a huge, there, there's a spring Q and I believe that there's a fall Q. Yes. And these are the, 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 the statewide, the California education conferences. Um, and, um, 
I believe that there are local Q conferences as well. Uh, at least in some mm-hmm. of the local Q organizations have have Q conferences, but the 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 two big ones uh, are are always always. I'm watching on Twitter and I'm looking on Facebook and it's like, damn, you guys look like you're having just so much fun. Looks and so I am amazing. just up here, in, especially in spring queue because it's still pretty crappy weather in March in Toronto in in Barrie. And it's like, it's snowy here and you guys are just... Palm Springs, California in the spring. Loving oh, life. 85 California. degrees. And so oh. that, that's a that's a conference that I'm dying to go to. Mm. Um, is is one of these Q conferences. Uh, they do a lot of cool stuff with podcasting now. There, there are a lot of cool California podcasters yes. uh, in education. Uh, I'm thinking of you know Scott Nunes and um, uh, the 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 beer uh, the beer ed tech edu, edu podcast that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The beer edu podcast. Yeah. That's that's what I was <laughs> trying to get that out. Uh, those guys are in California as well, uh, and I believe one of them is part of one of the organizers. So mm. um, I would I would love to get down to California uh, and, and go to one of the queues. Last year during Spring Queue, so last March, I was at Wonder Workshop's head office in San Francisco. Oh yeah, well, I remember Spring that. Was you, happening. you thought about driving down and or I something? I thought about fl- flying, down flying down because I could get a ticket for like eighty dollars to fly mm. from San Francisco to Palm Springs. It would probably cost you that much in the Uber just to get to. <laughs> so <laughs> you know what I, I, mean? <laughs> I was like, I have the. I have the money, but I didn't have the time, mm-hmm. and I, I wanted to pretty bad though. It was it was uh, it was awful. Um, Connect is is the wild card in here, mm. but I wanted to give a shout out to Canada's largest ed tech conference. Uh, it's called Connect. It happens in the the last couple days of April. It's usually like the last couple days of April or the first in the first couple days of May. Um, it usually overlaps between April and May every year. I've been lucky to be the spotlight speaker. I was the spotlight speaker last year at Connect, and I'm a spotlight speaker again this year at Connect, which is pretty cool. Um, it's it's a small conference by U.S. conference standards, so probably about three to four thousand people. Still so, pretty good. So you know, yeah. uh, about the same size as as Q. Mm. Is what I would I would imagine. So bigger than most of these other ones, bigger than bigger than Badge Summit, bigger than Spark Games and Education, um, but probably about the size of Q. And so if you live, so so even I know like some Americans that come up to connect, like Michael Dresick mm-hmm. actually is a staple of connect he's done he's done um ignites at connect um he's done tons of sessions at connect um Mm. and he's there all the time so um michael dresick is at least one american but i would i would love to see more if you live in buffalo or rochester where does um, it happen international falls yeah niagara falls niagara falls sorry yeah yeah Yeah. international falls is minnesota sorry (laughs) i was gonna make it closer to me (laughs) yeah if you live if you live in upstate new york connect Mm. is uh connect is a great conference to go to for americans um even from like if you're in albany or 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 new york city Mm. um you know it's it's not that bad of a drive and and worth worth coming up to 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 come to connect it's it is a really good conference so you can always come back to this segment of the best by checking out our blog at oneducationpodcast.com or watching it on YouTube. Just search for On Education and check out the playlist. Want to support On Education? Check out our Patreon site at patreon.com slash oneducationpod. When we come back, one of our conversations from FETC will be speaking with Desiree Alexander. Stay with us. On Education is brought to you by the Badge Summit. Do you have plans to attend the ISTE conference this summer? Come one day early and participate in the best hidden gem conference in the United States. Badge Summit 2020 will take place in Costa Mesa, California on June 22nd. There will be many amazing educators to collaborate with on topics such as digital badges, credentials, gamification, and more. To learn more about the Badge Summit, simply visit bit.ly slash badge summit. All right, friends, we are here with Desiree Alexander. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. So we're here at FETC and you're here. And for people who don't 
know you or are familiar with your work. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes, of course. Well, I'm Desiree Alexander. I am the founder CEO of Educator Alexander Consulting. And that brings me around the world teaching teachers, mentoring teachers, really on any content that they may need or want. I go to districts and help them out with certain things that they need. And that's pretty much my life is teaching nice. teachers and um, mentoring teachers. That's awesome. So is it based in instructional coaching, like pedagogy techniques or? Sometimes, sometimes? it okay. depends. Yeah. I, um, I also work with, I'm a regional director for a nonprofit in Louisiana, mm. which is where I'm based. And um, it's an educational nonprofit, so I also do trainings for them. And it really just depends on what they're looking for. So gotcha. there, is, there are a lot of technology. I do a lot of educational leadership type sessions, Great. growth mindset, mm. um, classroom management. So it's really, it's all educational, but it's really depending on what they need at that time. Gotcha. Also people that are looking to get into consulting and branding themselves and do that kind of thing as well. As you just, I just had a principal just walk up actually to our booth here, which was an interesting thing. I thought she was going to talk to us about the podcast or whatever it might be. And she just asked a, an important question with someone that actually is working with instructing teachers and this hyper focus uh, on social emotional learning, and she said that she feels as a uh, a principal that that is a content area which she wants to learn more about and basically uh, make sure that she has all of the knowledge and skills necessary to be able to address any of these types of things with our students. Okay, is that kind of what you're hearing too as you travel throughout? the country doing I your think, job? I think, you know, in education, we always have these buzzwords mm -hmm. and these things that come up. But I think this is a, this is one that is gaining steam mm -hmm. for a good reason. Yes. Sure, yeah. Because we're not teaching the whole child and we're not, you know, we're so, we got so test focused. Yes. And mm. we got away from actually making sure the child was okay, mm. you know, that we were teaching. So I, I do think it's something that, is w worth um, exploring and I do things with healthy student relationships a yes. lot of my educators um, not a lot but some of my educators are looking for those types of trainings like how do I form a healthy relationship with students how do I make sure that my students are getting what they need how do I make sure that my lessons are culturally relevant mm. those type of things so I, I do think it's definitely something that needs more of a focus even at conferences like this mm. I've never heard I love the reframing lately that I've been hearing about like the, the child who acts out in class in particular and the reframing of that narrative of, of like, like that's a signal that those kids need help. Yes. And we've never, I've never, and I'll admit, and that's a shame, I had never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. But the last couple of years, the conversation has really changed around those kinds of things and teaching the whole child. Um, is it's it's huge and it's so important and like you just said there are things that are buzzwords because they're buzzwords mm -hmm. words and they're catchy and they're whatever new technology and whatever and then there are things that are gaining steam because they need to gain steam because yes. we need to be talking about them more and sel is absolutely one of them and it's i mean um i love that the narrative has changed and i love that that people like you are are helping change that narrative it's important right i, I agree it, it really is important because you can't really teach a child content if the child is not fully there the child doesn't feel safe hmm. the um you know and it really is all about them it's all about the students that's why we have jobs that's why we do what we do yeah. so making sure that they are actually present in the mind body and soul is important before we can teach them english math science totally you know history and everything else that we're teaching them so you're um doing a ton of stuff here at FETC. <laughs> FETC. Yes. like there are people who have like i have an okay schedule like other than the podcast i get but like you look at your schedule and it's nuts so and it's all over the place in, in terms of like some really good stuff so talk a little bit about a bunch of the things that you're doing here because i think that there's some really exciting stuff to talk about there okay so what i've done a couple of workshops yesterday so what i have coming up um i have one session on it's a panel on friday that deals with your ed tech footprint increasing your ed tech footprint mm. and it really is all about how do I do, how do I get a PLN? 
You know, how mm. do I increase my PLN? How do I begin consulting? How do I begin this type of stuff? So many people want to get in the field mm. and they're like, That's hey, interesting. it's so busy. Everybody's doing what I want to do. Yeah. But what I usually tell my educators is someone needs to hear your voice. Even if I'm saying the exact same thing that you're saying, somebody needs to hear it from you. Mm. So there's enough space for everybody in that's this field, point. in this game. So that's uh, one of the sessions I'm doing on Friday. I'm also doing a, a tech for administrators today. Great. So just concentrating, not just, oh, here are a whole bunch of tech tools, but just, hey, these are some of the ways you can actually use it as an administrator walking that campus every day um, and doing the things that you do every day. I'm also doing a Google for Productivity today, which is always one of my favorite classes mm. um, because it's just a whole lot of tips. It's just tip, tip, yeah. tip, tip, tip. Um, and I tell them, you know, some stuff you may know, some stuff you don't. Sure. You're already doing this stuff. Let's do it more productively. For sure. So that's another one that I'm doing. So um, and I have, I think, two more sessions tomorrow. I, it's hard to keep track um, without looking at my, my schedule. But, um, yeah, so, so those are so some the of the Google sessions I'm doing. Google um, productivity. Are we talking everything from, like, Gmail, calendar, extensions, extensions yes. docs, yes. those Keep kinds of things? All, yeah. Okay, Just I get you. Just different tools, and it's not like a one in, like, one tool, blah, blah, blah. It's, hey... I know you're already doing a search. This is how you can do a search better. Okay. I know you're already using, you know, Gmail. This is how you can use it better. This is how you use, can use Calendar better. Yep. Um, here's OCR. Just different things that we're we're already doing. Just how do I do it quicker? Great. I think we neglect that a lot too. Yes. I Like, a, for example, in our orientation for our new teachers, there's so many things to cover. I mean, we we yes. look we look through our, our and we're trying to revamp ours at our district level. And we look through the things that we have to cover in such a tiny bit of time. And we just neglect some things. We just kind of just either pass over very quickly or just expect someone to be able to use, for example, yes. the Gmail suite, yes. uh, which, we, which we do also use. And to use it productively, as you said, and to use it in a way that will help you to make sure that... Uh, you maintain your schedules and yes. you can follow up on emails. Uh, you can categorize the emails into different things. Yes. And a lot of us are doing that kind of learning just like on our own, you know? Yeah. And, a, and a, some people are just struggling with just the abundance of information coming in of and course. then not being able to go ahead and organize it. So that's a fantastic thing that I think we, we, we tend to just pass over. We think that people should just already know it, which they do a lot of us don't. We, yeah. we have to learn it, you know, those things. And, and it's a couple of things. When you're dealing with new teachers and teachers new to your district, you don't know what they know. So when you do have to start at a basic level, you only have enough, you only have so much time in the day, you know, to teach stuff. So I think that is where just good professional development comes from that is ongoing. So you're not just saying we're going to have it at the beginning of the year, then, oh, well, help yourself out for the rest of the year. So having that ongoing PD where you can say, okay, I taught you the basis of Gmail, but now we're going to go deeper into it. So I think that's the that's the key to fighting that. We had um, Ken Shelton on. Yes. Just... Uh, a week and a half, two weeks ago. Okay. And uh, spent a lot of time talking to him about digital equity. Yes. And you're, you're on a panel with him yes. tomorrow about this. And this is something that is, um, we talk about on the podcast, stuff like this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we've, we've even had like um, think tank um, okay. people on to talk about like uh, uh, funding mm -hmm. issues with school funding and... This is another one of those things that is being talked about a lot now that wasn't talked about at all five years ago and is another one of those conversations that absolutely needs to keep happening. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, about what you're going to talk about a little in that panel? And, I mean, this is a critical yes. conversation. Critical conversation in education. So that's kind of the perfect question. I'll pay you later um, <laughs> because we're going to talk about exactly what you just said. All of these buzzwords that come out, anti-racism, anti-bias, uh, digital citizenship, digital equity, all these things. And a lot of people don't quite understand mm. what they mean. Mm -hmm. And then going further, 
how, what does this mean for education? Yeah. What does this practically mean for my classroom? What should I be thinking about? Um, even when we hear equity, the first thing we think of is race, and that's all we think of. But yeah. it's so much more than that. Mm-hmm. So it's just going through those buzzwords and saying, well, this is what it means, and then this is what it means for education. And this is a very interactive panel that we'll be doing tomorrow. Um, and it it's really letting people discuss the terms in a safe space because not everybody feels like they have that safe space to bring it up and discuss it and say, I don't know what this means. I'm a white guy. Uh, I mean, I know exactly what that's like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but, but we need to have spaces we have where we can to. talk about it. Because if you to. can't even ask the questions exactly. and feel comfortable asking the questions, where do you even start? Exactly. Right. Exactly. And that's why I like panels like this where it's like, no, this is a safe space. Ask. Yeah. Ask. Yeah. You know, and well, if, it's, uh, if it's something offensive, we'll say, well, you know what? How that was phrased is offensive because of that. Like, yeah. it's a teachable moment. That, that's the whole point of this. And everyone's learning. Yes. Everybody Every, is. And, if we can't allow teachers to have the space to yes. learn this stuff from the position that they don't know. Exactly. And the world is like, I've said this before, the world is shifting mm-hmm. under our feet in so many ways mm-hmm. when it relates to equity. And it's not just like race. We're talking about LGBTQ stuff Everything. and mm-hmm. like even the words and the vocabulary is changing. And we've been talking this way for 30, 40, 50, hundred mm-hmm. years in some ways. And there are new ways to even say things. Yes. And everyone is learning. Yes. And we need to be, we need to give people the space to learn that without killing them if they get it wrong the first time. Agreed. I still, like I, I've talked about this, I, I work a lot with, um, with a, a couple trans folk who, and I still, and it's almost because it's a, like a tick that I say, how you doing, man? Or how's mm-hmm. it, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, I'm not doing that intentionally. I'm not doing that from a place of, ignorance like at least not in my mind and in mm-hmm, my heart mm-hmm. um it's it's getting yourself out creating new habits yes and creating new mindsets yes i think and i i'm, I'm so happy that people like you and ken and 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 these other groups are leading like this charge to like re let's reframe but give people the space yes. to reframe it right yeah amazing how can people connect with you online learn more about you where do they go if they want to connect with you uh yeah so i, I actually want to go back to do something, it. Go back said to something that, please. and then I'll, I'll talk about that but um i like you said the word is the world is shifting yes and one of the things that i always kind of come back to is it has shifted we're the ones that's catching up uh, um totally the word, so i'm like everything is has thankfully changed and yeah. looks differently and things like that and we're the ones playing catch up making sure that um we are using the right terminology and that we are having the right mindset and i think the biggest thing is just being open to that is to being open to saying well you know what i don't know everything mm-hmm. i need to learn mm-hmm. I, I think that's the because there's not everybody doing that you know, no, not everybody's being very open few people to learn. are doing that, exactly. to be completely honest. So it's, it's just having that mindset to be open is step one, two, three, four, and five. So how so can people can connect, connect with, with you? Yes. yes. So uh, on Twitter, I'm at Educator Alex. Every other social media, I'm Educator Alexander. So Twitter, I mean, I'm uh, sorry, Facebook, Instagram, everything else, uh, Periscope, um, YouTube. Um, my website is EducatorAlexander.com. Hmm. And my email is EducatorAlexander at Gmail or Desiree at educatoralexander.com. So literally everything is Educator Alexander, We're gonna find except you. for Twitter. That's yes, awesome. it's Educator Alex. And we'll yes. put all that information in the show notes. Yes. Desiree, Alexander, thank you so thank much you. for joining us. Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Glenn Irvin. My co-host is Mike Washburn. On Education is part of the On Podcast Media Network. You can listen to this show and many others by great educators like Monica Burns, Mike Matera, Tisha Richmond, and many more by visiting onpodcastmedia.com. Want to get in touch with us? Check out our website at oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Mike is at Mr. Washburn on Twitter, and I can be found on Twitter at Irv Spanish. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. We're also on Instagram at oneducationpod. 
want to support On Education? Visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash oneducation. There, you can get access to full videos of the podcast and so much more. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we would be thrilled if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or a review in Apple Podcasts or the Google Play Store. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. It helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Classcraft, for supporting us. Check out classcraft.com slash oneducation to learn more about them. Thanks as always for listening, stay awesome, and see you soon.